What up, Get Up Nation? My name is Ben Benick, the host of the Get Up Nation podcast and co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Lurong Living, Adam Greenberg. On this Memorial Day, I offer you episode 22. Recently, I spoke with Travis Partington of Oscar Mike Radio. A Marine with a passion to serve the veteran community with this radio show, it was my honor to connect with Travis, listen to how he decided to invest himself in the service of those who've served and learn more about his passion to end veteran suicide. If you live in the greater Boston area and share a passion to bring healing and hope to those who are dealing with the psychological impact of violence and war, connect with Travis. He's Oscar Mike on the move toward and for more conscious systems that truly meet the needs of people who place their lives on the altar of freedom and survive. If you're interested in creating systems where people are able to effectively heal into wholeness after experiencing traumatic stress, trauma, and violence, please take the time to not only listen to this podcast, but join Travis, Oscar Mike Radio, Get Up Nation, and me in creating a world where wounds are soothed and bound at the highest and deepest level where conflict is resolved with unparalleled power and efficiency, and where people who offer their entire selves to create a brilliant world free of terror, oppression, and abuse experience the honor and satisfaction of knowing their sacrifices were worth every moment. Get Up Nation, if personal and organizational resistance can be established in these environments, just think of what that means for every facet of society, whether in refugee populations, populations who have survived oppressive and abusive forms of government, Populations who have survived natural disaster, domestic violence survivors, human trafficking survivors, those attempting to heal from adverse childhood experiences, those suffering from the effects of poverty and mental illness, the list goes on and on. We are on the cusp of a new era. Be a part of creating a world where no one gets left behind. Veterans lead the way into the most violent places on earth. Now they're helping lead the way out of the most affected places within. This episode is dedicated to Nathan Vaco and Dan Thompson, who made the ultimate sacrifice to create a world free from terror. Rest in peace, brothers. I'm doing my very best to honor the sacrifice you made and to be worthy of it. Travis, thank you for joining Get Up Nation. I appreciate your efforts to serve the veteran community and really enjoy taking in the content that you generate with Oscar Mike Radio. Will you share with the Get Up Nation listeners what Oscar Mike Radio is? Absolutely, Ben. Welcome, 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 welcome. I'm happy to be on the Get Up with the Get Up Nation. Um, <laughs> just excited to be here, uh, Ben. Uh, Oscar Mike Radio, or you know, in the military speak, as you know, was either is usually means on mission or on the move, and that's what Oscar Mike is about. It's about raising awareness for people who have taken. Whatever it is, whether it's crocheting a blanket for veterans, starting a nonprofit, starting their own business, whatever they're doing, either to support military and veterans or veterans who are doing their own outreach for veterans of their own business, it's about raising awareness about what these people do. And the reason I'm excited about that is veterans and military people have to continually reinvent themselves a lot more than most civilians do. And with limited resources and time, so it's a very interesting focus for me. I saw that you had recently done a giveaway, or are you still in the process of the giveaway? Still in the process of doing the giveaway, yes. Episode 52 or thereabouts, I interviewed a woman, her name is Julie Lovely, and she does a nonprofit called Wild Hearts Horses for Heroes, and it's equestrian therapy for veterans with PTSD. And it's just fascinating to go and watch her work, not only with the horse, but with the veterans. It's a very different kind of, of setup. And she gave me two tickets to her benefit event uh, on April 21st at 6 p.m. And they're having their silent auction benefit dinner, and it all is to raise funds to keep the program going. And it's a very important deal because in the past she's done only one 10-week session for the year, this year, she's doing two because of the man and because of the need. And so I'm excited to be doing this for her. And she gave me two tickets, and I said, you know what, I, I, I want to give these away and let people see what she's doing. So if people can answer the question when I actually met her and email me or, or drop me a Facebook message, uh, my email is traps at com, and you're in the greater Boston area, we'll make that happen for you so you can come to the to the event. I love what you're doing here. I love people who serve, especially those who have served. It's a sacred thing. 
I know the Mentors for Military podcast, they just put out some statistics. Robert Gowan had put out that the statistics today are 0.5% of the American population has served in the armed forces. And my understanding is you also are a Marine. Is that accurate? I did serve in the Marine Corps from 95 to 98. I was a Hawk missile operator, which uh, was a radar-operated missile and did all that. It was, it was great. So this is also a way to give back to brothers and sisters Marine or not, who have served, which is why I'm so interested to be a part of this uh, Get Up Nation podcast. It's really special that you're doing this kind of uh, outreach. Can you describe the process of how you created Oscar Mike Radio? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I grew up one of these, you know, strange kids who my dad listened to a lot of talk radio, and I really liked the process. And, and you know, I, I guess too, I. Um, I'm a big Rush fan of the group, and they talk about the Spirit of Radio song, and I, I totally bought into, you know, what they expressed there. And I've always, I've always liked the medium. It's kind of funny. Uh, you've got television, YouTube, all these other video things, but still, a lot of people will listen to the radio and like that voice coming over the airwaves. And about two and a half years ago, a, a lot of friends that I knew were in trouble with PTSD. A couple of people made a very permanent choice to deal with it. And I'm like, something's got to give here. And I was kind of floundering around trying to find out where I fit in. And the idea hit me by watching um, some YouTube videos about podcasts that, well, maybe I could do that. But still didn't really have the idea of how to execute it. And then just by sheer happenstance, a friend of mine said, they're having this media day at uh, Massasoit Community College in uh, Brockton, Massachusetts. And they had a team there. They're called Hubazoo. And they do a lot of podcast and media content support and production. And I met with them and pitched my idea. And my idea was, was to do a, a weekly military podcast about veterans, military, explain some things, why we do what we do as veterans, why the military does certain things, my military story, on, 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 thinking, well, there's a segment of the population that will like that, right? And they kind of got me into how to do this. And then once they saw that I was committed and serious, they really threw some some time and effort behind me, and that's how I, I was able to launch Oscar Mike Radio. And at first, you know, you, you know how it is. Uh, ben, you're creating content, you're doing your thing, and you're trying to figure out where you fit in, but eventually you get a process going. It, it's now a, a weekly process. It's something that I enjoy doing very much. Stories like Julie's, stories like yours, stories like um, other people who are either trying to figure out certain things they're doing with their business or nonprofit or just somebody who cares about veterans is, is, is there's tons of them out there and these people don't look for limelight, the spotlight, their names and red red letters, but I think their efforts are, are valuable and so authentic that the story needs to be told. And I find a lot of value in telling that story and I learn so much about what's out there in the world that I don't know about. So it's 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 a very rewarding process, even though a lot of times it's just me on my computer trying to figure out how certain things work. And you focus post-traumatic stress, and you focus on veteran suicide. In our discussions leading up to this, you talked about how you're tired of burying veterans. Could you go into why you feel it's so important to invest in veterans who are dealing with post-traumatic stress? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, you know, I'm, I'm a member of my Marine Corps League, and I keep in contact with, with people that I serve with. And it breaks my heart when you have a, a person take a make a permanent choice to deal with what's plaguing them. And PTSD exists in all forms. You don't have to have served in combat to have PTSD. But to get to a point in your life where you feel like there is no hope and no one cares about you, or people care about you, but they just don't get you and, and they want you to to be well because they don't see anything wrong with you. I mean, one of the things I hear is, well, the, the guy with the missing leg or arm gets a lot more 
help and support than me, and I, I just can't do it. That bothers me a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I I haven't suffered with PTSD due to combat. I didn't serve in combat, but I definitely understand where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. And with all the the focus on certain things in this country in this world, it's absolutely shameful to me that we we send these kids to combat. They come back. And they know something is wrong with them, and they try to get help, and they're told, well, no, we can't help you out because you're not really messed up or, you know, sorry, you, you got out as a with an other than honorable discharge, and we can't help you out. Well, come to find out the reason they got discharged is that they were having problems in their unit. If I may, I don't mean to take up too much of your time that, that if you want to. Oh, go ahead, uh, all day long. If you the, want. Okay, sure. I do one of my podcasts about the kid who hit out on the John Paul Jones, the USS John Paul Jones. It's a missile destroyer that the Peter Mims, he's a seaman who hit on that ship for almost a week, right? And he got kicked out of the Navy. Well, come to find out, he was having a lot of problems with his marriage. A lot of lot of issues around that, a lot of issues in general, a lot of issues trying to adjust and, and, and couldn't do it. And the fact of the matter was he did reach out to his staff and COs and COs and his, his officer leadership for help and help didn't materialize. And he, as his mental state broke down, the only thing he did was hide out because he was trying to deal with what life was throwing at him. He's an extreme example, but it it goes to show that a lot of these guys, and and women too, deal with this before they come to the civilian world. They they are are broken before they get out. And as you know, if they're they're scared to ask for help, because if you do, well, then that causes a lot of actions to follow. You're going to be restricted in your duty. You're going to be restricted in promotion. You're going to be going to have your security clearance revoked. You're, you're basically right. being you know, ostracized while you're serving. And, and there's got to be a better way we can deal with that. If we can build you know, aircraft that cost you know, $200 million a piece, there's got to be a way we can support the, these people while they're in dealing with this. And so he's the extreme example. There's also the person that deals with this, doesn't say anything, doesn't ask for help, gets out. And now all of a sudden you're trying to reintegrate into civilian life. You're trying to get a job. You're trying to get transportation, get housing, and you have none of the support system you had in the military. You, you don't have that camaraderie of your buds, of your crew, and it's even harder. And you have, if you have a, a spouse or children, uh, they're trying to get used to you again and, and deal with the changes that you had because you served. And it's hard for them to be there and support you as well. So add all that up. In, in some cases, I feel sometimes that, you know, we have 22 veterans a day killing themselves, and that's an actual fact. It's surprising there's not more. Mm. But I feel really feel that we as a society, this is not just a military problem, it's a societal problem. Could we do more? I feel we could. And, and, and for me, uh, Ben, I, I just am tired of seeing – a, a 24 to 40 year old person feel like there's there's no hope, there's no way they can deal with life, and they just kill themselves. Absolutely. Now you really focused on, and I've talked with other veterans about benefits of non medication type treatments, like the animal uh, treatment, like service dogs and uh, the equine therapy, and then also uh, meditation and mindfulness training. Would you talk a little bit about the value that you've seen uh, in these non-pharmacological treatments uh, in your discussions with veterans? Sure, absolutely. This all stemmed from uh, work I've done with veterans who, these guys are older than me. They're They're in the 55 and over demographic. And the treatment for them, for their PTSD or mental health issues, was simply let's, let's, give them medicine to deal with this symptom. 
But what happened is, as you take these drugs, there's drugs that have side effects, right? And there's also drugs that will deal with these side effects. So what happens is it becomes the revolving hamster wheel of, uh, of pain and frustration where you, you, you start off with one, and by the time that you're, you're done, you're taking between 15 to 20 pills a day just to try to get through life normally. Mm-hmm. And these pills have an impact on your quality of life and your ability to be a, a somewhat normal person in, in a lot of different realms in our normal day-to-day existence. And what started happening is, is some people said, you know, hey, I took this yoga class and started feeling good. And these guys started figuring out a way to get off their meds but still be able to move forward. Uh, They had the support system there from family and friends. They had this class they went to and it started working. And what I was told was, and what I saw in my work with these veterans is, okay, the first couple of months were rocky, but a year later, these, these, these veterans were doing things they couldn't do before. And it didn't matter what it was, whether it was yoga, meditation, breathing therapy, uh, a dog, like there was a, an Army veteran I talked to who um, had a, 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 a dog, and the dog got him out of his house. He was ordering Domino's pizza three meals a day, and he, he ballooned up to 400 pounds. Got the dog, had to had to go outside and walk the dog and be out around people. And, you know, in the course of 18 months, he lost 200 pounds, and he kept it off. He's feeling great. Uh, the equestrian therapy is a very different kind of therapy than dog therapy is because horses are not predators, so they have to be really self-aware of their environment and surroundings. So a horse will actually watch you and respond to how you are acting. So these veterans who are, like, angry and frustrated and dealing with social anxiety issues have to almost come to what I would call, from watching it, a zen state, where they have to really calm down but be authoritative and be, you know, confident in their actions. And they come away from that session feeling empowered and confident. Well, this allows them to go out into society, whether it's dog, whether it was any kind of these therapies, doesn't matter what it is. It allows them to go out and, and uh, deal with certain things they couldn't deal with before or they had to have medicine for. And to summarize, go back to the dog therapy, what happens a lot of times with veterans who have um, support dogs. Th- these people don't want to talk to people. They are very, very anxious in a public setting talking to people. Well, the dog allows them to buffer that because people come up and talk to the dog and they find themselves talking to dogs. I interviewed one guy on my podcast who has a support dog and what he found was whether he wanted to or not, he had to start talking to people again. He had to start, you know, interacting with human beings and all of a sudden he's doing things that he hasn't done in years because the dog allows him the the, the vehicle to do that. You said that you work with homeless veterans currently. How do you serve them? I teach a computer class, to, and it's mainly an older. These these are gentlemen my age and older who, for lack of lack of a better term, miss the whole internet thing. Um, everything is now through the VA, through housing, medical, what had whatever it is. Almost all of it is done on the web and or through email. Mm-hmm. So these gentlemen would not be able to partake of the services that are there for them or resources that are available to them because they didn't know how to answer email, because they weren't comfortable filling in a logon form on a website, or they would forget appointments because they didn't know how a calendar works. So once they got their own email address and once they figured out how that worked, then I was able to show them how a calendar worked how um, a to-do list works. And then we got really crazy. We got really out there, and I showed them how um, cloud storage works. So they were able to take their forms, and some of them took pictures of their forms with their phone and uploaded it to their cloud storage. Well, they had their information all right there on their phone. That was the last part of this. 
And once we got the phone and their email all working, Veteran A would make an appointment for the VA in two weeks, and he'd get a reminder five days before that. And he had to bring Form 19099N, right? I'm just making that up. But the fact of the thing is he was able to come to the appointment on time. He was able to access his form with his counselor. They were able to create a plan and then make his appointment right there on his phone for the next counseling session, and he knew what he had to do. All of a sudden, you have these these homeless veterans start taking control of their lives and doing things they hadn't done before. And they were able to explore other things like photography and even some basic programming or just being able to reconnect with friends and family members in, in, a, in a real way they hadn't done before. As you serve people or transition into that civilian sector, what do you feel is successful for, for people making that transition? Oh, man, I mean... Very, very simply, we have to as veterans and military guys because we're expected to to be like, you know, super Mr. Awesome Guy, right? You have to be able to be open to asking for help. And then, you know, taking criticism, I mean, it's not a big deal for us because we get yelled at every day, right? You know, no, within reason, but we're getting negative, <laughs> we're getting negative reinforcement all the time from our, mm-hmm. our military experience. But the thing that we're very bad at because we're, we're expected to be self-sufficient and self-motivating and self-guiding is asking for help. And when I asked for help and was in a mindset to take that help and then build a plan around that help, I was much more effective. And the podcast is a perfect example of that. If I hadn't asked for help, I, I could have done it. But it wouldn't have gotten to where it is the way it had if if I hadn't you know taken the advice given to me. And what I see is a lot a lot of people get out and they have a plan. They they've gone through sets briefing, separation briefing, right? And then they get home and the plan changes because you got the first contact, unknown variables of dealing with civilian life, and trying to get in civilian mindset. They get frustrated. They get they get discouraged, and then they just, for lack of a better term, give up. And they give up because, again, it's hard to sit there and say, okay, you know, yes, I learned how to work on radars. Yes, I learned how to identify an aircraft 40 miles away. You know, figuring out how the best way to sell what I did in the military is, is I can't do this. And if I ask for help, I'm going to look like an idiot. Well, you have to get over that. And that's what I keep telling people is, there's, and there's people out there, Ben, there's people out there that want to help you out. That's the thing I'd also try to you know, emphasize for your listeners. There are people out there right now that if they know you have a problem, and if they see that you are trying to help yourself, they will extend their their time and effort to helping you out because there's a real enthusiasm to help veterans out. So if people see that you're trying to help yourself and people understand what you're trying to do, if you're sincere, honest, and authentic about what you need and where you're trying to go, you'd be surprised. There's people out there that civilians who've never served in the military wouldn't know an M16 from an M1 tank, but they know how to set up a resume or set up a project plan or help you fill out a, a business loan or a small a small grant from the government to get your your project, your process, your nonprofit, your yourself going again. They're out there, and so there's no excuse. There really isn't of why you can't raise a paw in the air and ask for help. Get up nation. We talk a lot about resilience and overcoming challenges, and there is a skewed perspective that's in the world uh, in military environments or or any environment where there's challenges that people are facing becomes this sense of if you ask for help, that's weakness. And I think that's really valuable for you to articulate how no person is 100% amazing at everything. In some work that I've done de-escalating violent or traumatic situations, I remember dealing with a veteran who it had gotten to a very intense level where I guess I won't go into all the details of it to protect privacy, but law enforcement was involved and it was unsure whether or not the veteran was going to harm himself or, or anybody else. But in speaking with that veteran, as we went through the process of de-escalating the situation, a relationship had come to an end and some alcohol had been involved. And what it just came down to after deploying empathy and listening, he just kept saying over and over, I'm so tired. I am so tired. And he had been 
carrying that burden, that intense bur- burden of feeling like he had to have it all together at all times, that he had to be impenetrable. He could not admit weakness. It was ingrained in him where he could not say or acknowledge, you know, I, I am not 100%. You know, I don't have it all together. And so just in that moment of making it okay to be vulnerable and to say that it's actually empowering and that it's not that you're less of a man or less of a woman or less of a person to acknowledge that you do have something where you need some support or you need some help, don't you think that it also helps create cohesion when veterans allow themselves to receive something good from the people that they have served, and I think it's very healing. I think I understand, and and you brought up a really great point there about the civilians wanting to help out and being validated because I would remind our brothers and sisters listening to this podcast that there was a time in this country where there wasn't that interest at all. It was the Vietnam War and Korean War. They, they were They were largely brought back home and forgotten. No one cared. Right. And, and that's starting to turn around right now. And, and to your point, I, I would let some of my civilian you know, friends come with me to help these homeless veterans out. And once that happened, I, and, and it's so good you brought that up, when, when they sat down and saw these veterans as people, it made this very real to them. And once the veterans saw that these people were here to help them and not – like you said, not criticize them, not judge them, but just help them. It's a whole different attitude, vibe, and energy coming from the group versus some guy who's just up there talking for an hour and he's going to go home and never come back again. And so I think you're right. I think there are people out there willing to help, but we as veterans have to be willing to receive that help. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a very good point you brought up. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's very affirming to to the veterans because in those moments when they're overseas, when they're sleeping in a hole, when they're in a vehicle and they don't know if that road's going to blow up underneath them, and they get internet access for a little while, they check their email, they get tremendously painful news from home, whether it's a spouse leaving them or you know something they can't do anything about because they're a thousand miles away, and then to feel that pain and to feel that kind of helplessness, and then in all of that that they've done. And it's all to keep people safe at home. It's all in honor of the American people. It's um, it's not some just some concept. I mean, it's people who do this for other people. It's not some page in a book or a, a movie. And these are people who right now are overseas somewhere in some town nobody's ever heard of who are working to prevent terrorist groups from ripping apart our country. And maybe there's a reason why we're talking about this. Maybe somebody listening needs to hear that, especially if somebody is listening is having survivor guilt or is thinking that they need to constantly be impenetrable all the time. It just shreds relationships. It shreds children who want to relate to you. It shreds spouses who are trying to care for you or just the, the populace who wants to say thank you. I think it's a huge thing where somebody is ingrained to sacrifice to allow themselves to take that moment of pleasure when someone says thank you. Say thank you, help you get a suit, help you get a tie. You, you know, you mentioned uh, relationship problems. You know, I'm just going to be blunt and say that, you know, people don't understand that a lot of, a lot of these people's problems are our fellow brothers and sisters who serve. A lot of the downhill slide begins in in this area, and I and I don't want to take up this podcast with that aspect of it, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that that has a severe effect. You are halfway across the world, and you get some bad news. And I've watched it. I'm sure you have been. You watched people that were awesome soldiers had their stuff squared away, get that get that email, get that phone call or text or see the Instagram clip and their world spirals away. And instead of just laughing at that person, we've got to find a way to prevent that from getting worse because going to alcohol, going to other things is not the answer. And just like we've talked about before, there are people who are in the military, out of the military, who will understand your situation regardless if it's a relationship issue or a social anxiety issue because I get told all the time that a lot of vets only feel comfortable 
talking with other vets, and that's that's true to a large extent. I'm the same way. But I also have to understand that there are also civilians out there that are very interested in what we're doing and will take time out of their schedule just to get to know us a little bit better. So I think what you're talking about should be uh, talked about more. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think that if we dig a little bit deeper, we can understand what's going on, especially for the spouse who wants to understand what's going on with her husband. You know, I don't I don't know about you, but I've I've talked to spouses who are at wit's end trying to be there for their, their guy. They've seen him change and they just don't know what to do. And and I, and this is where I feel that uh women come into play a lot more than, than, than guys do. Because a female will listen, she'll understand, and maybe she doesn't understand the terminology or what's going on, but they are they have the emotional ability to connect and, and provide that support that's missing. And I would encourage spouses who are listening right now that if you have an issue, there are people out there that will support you during your, your time of trying to support your, your husband or significant other. If you're a husband, this applies to you too. The point is, you don't have to fight this battle alone. Right. This is why I do what I do. We're talking about some very sobering challenges. We're talking about some of the most severe problems that human beings can experience. What excites me is that in these dark moments where these challenges are tremendous, and this speaks to that, that warrior spirit within veterans. The military trains us to go fight the enemy to to keep people safe people say a lot of negative things these days about you know everything's so bad or the government or this or the, you know the, everything you know government systems are this way or that way or people are getting failed in so many ways i just think and what is very empowering to me why i really value people like you is because we say with that resilient spirit we are not going to allow something awful or painful or tremendously devastating to exist. We are going to fix it. We are going to listen. We are going to be honest in our analysis of what is happening, and we are going to find ways to overcome it. And I love going through your episode. You go into this. You say unabashedly, unafraid, you say, what is this problem? How do we fix it? This is the way I see it, is that veterans are going to lead the way. There's a lot of tumultuous, things happening at the VA right now. I see new headlines all the time. But I think when we as veterans take ownership of this and we say no more, when we say, like you have said in this podcast episode that we're recording right now, okay, so pharmacological ways, they're not being used correctly based on the experiences of the veterans that you talk to. So how is that done in a way that incorporates these other modalities? And I am looking forward to And I want to band together with any veterans that are listening. Let's not have a fatalistic attitude. Let's not leave each other in these dark, dark places. We all know that these challenges are there. And I just want to put that vision out there for anybody who is looking for it. I just want to put that vision, that objective out there that says no more, that says we're going to have an effective system in the military. We're going to have an effective VA system. We're going to have these effective systems, and we're going to invest our energy and invest ourselves and invest into into creating a process that doesn't leave people abandoned, that doesn't leave people in their living rooms and they dial the suicide hotline and they get put on hold for 45 minutes. That is unacceptable. When we have these dark experiences, trauma, people are being failed, time for people to step up, all of us together, and say no more and how do we fix it. And I think that's where veterans thrive is in that space especially as, as we talk about, you know, business owners that are that are uh, uh, impacting the business community and in, impacting their communities. I think of the grunt-style CEO, Daniel Alaric, who basically went down to all the flooding. He just said, let's deal with all the flooding in Houston. He just got his people together. They, they took over a community building, and they started helping people get their belongings out of houses that are submerged in waters. I think the bravery of the veteran community – once that's put into a proper perspective, it thrives and it overcomes these challenges. It says, what else do you got? I think it has to come down to this. I think the camaraderie aspect of what we do has to extend past our service in the service date. Yep. Um, I'm liking what I'm seeing on people with social media. There's more and more veterans starting to utilize 
YouTube live streams, Facebook groups, uh, Twitter feeds to keep in contact with their buddies they served with. It's very easy now to create a event to have people meet up. It's very easy to drop somebody a text to say, "Hey, what's going on? What's up?" What, yo, 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 yo. But I think at the end of the day, and I've said this before in my podcast, we have to have the mindset where if if you and you can be anything, PTSD, a broken pipe in my house, a wardrobe selection, whatever it is. That you has to be addressed is if you mess with one of us, you are messing with all of us. Mm-hmm. And that that is to say that if whatever challenge it is, if that person knows that he has a team behind him on his six at all times, yep. for the good and bad times, yep. then then that, that, that situation can be compiled into a simple five paragraph order and then dealt with. And once we get to truly owning our family again, then this kind of stuff will will be mitigated, be redundant. But I get frustrated that people have a better idea of what's going on with their fantasy football team than what's going on in their local government or their VA office who are veterans. I'm like, don't tell me about your football team and then sit there and Right, that you know you can't get seen by the VA. Take that same right. energy and apply it to that, and your VA problems will go away. Yeah. So, again, if you if you mess with one of us, you you got to know that you are going to be messing with all of us. We're trained to go into these places, to ingrain to us, leave no leave no man behind, leave no person behind. Once that comes into our own streets, once that comes into our neighborhoods and our homes, I just can't even. Conceive of the amazing cohesion, camaraderie, innovation, ingenuity, creativity, laughter that comes from that. I hope that we can all see that vision so that we can lock into it and create it in our own sphere of influence. Awesome, awesome. Am I always on the show with six questions? Can I run through them with you? Yes, let's do this thing. Who are you thankful for today? My sons. I have three, 17, 16, and 12. Love them. What are you thankful for today? I'm just thankful to be alive and really be enjoying life. How do you fuel the fire within you? I really don't know. I I think it's just an attitude that I I call being savage, where I'm going to go out wherever it is, whether it's, you know, trying to cook something, whether it's trying um, to learn a new language, whether it's just trying to get into a new book. And I'm just going to attack that with everything I have. It's just just a fuel and thirst for life. What was one thing that adversity has taught you to value? I kind of talked about before, I don't have to face my adversity alone. And then what are you doing today you never thought you could? Ooh, I'm going to say this. Uh, I am learning how to crochet. Long story short, one of my first podcast uh, things was this lady in Georgia does uh, crochets, blankets, and hats for veterans down there for her local VA. And I wanted to get some yarn for her and the group up here for Project Lion. And today they make like Cancer said, We'll donate all this yarn. You get to learn how to crochet. I'm finishing up my fourth blanket right now. That's amazing. I love that. What What are you going to do tomorrow that you never thought you could? I'm going to really focus on some video outreach. A lot of requests for uh, doing stuff with like YouTube, Facebook, and I don't know why I don't have a face for uh, YouTube or Facebook, but people uh, respond to video. So I'm looking for ways to. And then anybody who wants to learn more about you and Oscar Mike Radio, where can they learn more? OscarMikeRadio.com is my website. I'm on Facebook as Oscar Mike Radio, Twitter, Instagram, the same thing. My email is Traps at OscarMikeRadio.com. If you have an idea, question, concern, hit me up on all those places. and love to hear from you. And you're in the Boston area? Greater Boston area, yes, I am. Travis, it's been an honor to talk with you. I look forward to the amazing things we are going to accomplish together in the times to come. Hey, looking forward to having you on my podcast, Ben. I want to say I've had a great time talking with you. This has just flown by. Hey, I can't believe we just, it's like, a, like I said, my fingers are we're done already. God, we got to do this again.